Hello, welcome back to the Impact Lounge and your Impact Review. I'm your host, Adam, and as always, I'm joined by Ro. How are you doing, Ro? Great, Adam, and yourself? Yeah, really good, really good. I've got uh, another interview confirmed this week, hopefully coming up in the next couple of weeks. Still got to tie down the times, but uh, yeah, I'm delighted to say that very soon I will be interviewing Richard Justice. Uh, so that promises to be quite a good interview, so quite pumped about that one. But uh, how are things at your end? Great, man. Um, You know, I've got to catch Impact this past week. I know we talked offline. We have some different opinions, but, you know, for me, I really enjoyed it. Great. Well, we're going to dive into that in a second. But as always, if uh, we just want to thank you all for listening last week, for dropping us questions, for answering our trivia question of the week, which Rose is going to throw at you this week's one very shortly. Uh, but yeah, we really want to just uh, thank you all for tuning in and also make sure that you do tune in uh, and subscribe to the channel. You know, we want to get our subscription up to over 4000 very soon. We also want to make sure that we get lots of likes or dislikes. We don't really care as long as you have an opinion. That's what we always say every single week uh, also make sure you check out the teleconference from this week that went up with don callis uh, we got a question in on there i was asking away we were the first one on there so if you just listen to it and you listen to one thing uh, it'll be me at uh, the very beginning so anyway before we start uh, we do always say to you know make sure that you do check out uh, some of these other guys who are on uh, you know who review impacts and those kind of things uh, so do uh, yeah just make sure that uh, you are tuning in and uh, this week we're going to just go with the same one as last week which was the clock cleaners on youtube they're, they're linked to uh, Andre Corbeil's um, website so make sure you do check them out and they obviously did uh, also uh, comment on last week's show so thank you for those comments clock cleaners they do review other things other than impact as well so it's a great channel to tune into so uh, first before we get Ro asking us his trivia question of the week I just want to let you know what the answer was to last week's and uh, quite rightly as many of you said I was indeed drinking an apple teeny and unfortunately, I drank far too many Appletinis by the end of the show. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I was a bit struggling by the end. Anyway, uh, Ro, over to you. All right, listeners. The question this week is actually I'm going to do a name that wrestler. And here's the three clues I'm going to give you. The first clue is this wrestler has been with TNA slash Impact Wrestling on more than one occasion with one occasion being under a different gimmick. The second hint is this wrestler shares two things in common with Ishimori. And then my last hint is this wrestler appeared in a video, a music video by the real McCoy. So those are the clues and hints. So um, listeners, go ahead and give your best shot and let me know what you think. And make sure you drop it in the comments below. And also, if you know what those two things that he has in common with Ishimori, let us know. Let's see if you get the two things right. OK, so the other thing that we tend to do each week is we also pick out a listener's question of the week and cover it. Now, this question was asked two weeks ago, but it was also brought up again by um, Ramon Delage. And I'm going to keep on saying Ramon because it sounds way better than just saying Ramon. So uh, thank you, Ramon, for your question again. Um, this week's question was, what do you think about Ivalese joining Impact Wrestling? Should it happen now or should Impact be focusing more on the new knockouts and the characters before uh, before being bringing in someone new? So what did you think about this, Ro? Do you know much about her and uh, do you think they should be bringing her in? I'm not too familiar with her work. I know she has a strong following because I hear, you know, I've heard fans from Impact as well as other promotions talking about, you know, why don't they bring her in? And I know the word on her is her attitude or whatever. Who, uh, who knows? And I know even I even read an article where she was talking about with the whole partnership between Lucha and Impact. Why haven't they brought her on board? She doesn't know what's going on. With that said, you know, here here's my thing. I, I get what they're trying to do. You know, they, they really want to strengthen the knockouts division. But we all know you can't push everybody at the same time. Like, obviously, with Tessa being on board, she's going to be the focal point for the foreseeable future. And, I mean, you think about it, six months ago, we would have thought of that thought about that same thing with Taya. So, I mean, look, I'm always going to welcome 
you know, a new addition to the roster, but they need to have some sort of balance where they got, you know, the people who they're going to push and still have the people that they're trying to develop. So I guess to answer your question, I mean, if she can be a positive addition to the knockouts roster, then A, uh, I'm, I'm cool with it. But I do think, you know, somewhere down the line, they need to kind of try to work from within what they already have, because then you're going to end up having too much, then people get lost in the shuffle. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with it. I mean, I don't re- know much about her. Uh, I do remember her from Lucha Underground. I, I only really watched the first season of that, which I'm quite surprised because I really enjoyed the first season. And she was paired up with uh, Son of Havoc, Havoc, I should say. And uh, she was great. She was really good in the ring. And, and when I was looking, I saw an article about her today, funnily enough, and she was talking about backstage politics in NXT and TNA. And I didn't even know that she was with TNA, uh, but apparently she was with them in 2012, 2013 time, although I can't remember her. And um, she was talking about how she doesn't do a lot of backstage uh you know, politics. And that's why she's never been pushed like some of the other wrestlers. From what I've seen in ring, she, she's very, very good. But at the moment, the knockouts division, dare I say, it's never been stronger than it is now. I don't know if that's accurate, because obviously, you know, the beautiful people were very good. You know, when you had Orson Kong, Gail Kim, all these kind of people, it was very, very strong. But I would say if it's not better, it's certainly up there. So do we really need someone coming in at the moment when they've only got two hours worth of airtime as it is. Is she really going to be able to fit in with Tyre when Rosemary comes back, when the, you know when these two are back? You've got Ali, you've also got Sienna to come back, Kiera uh, Hogan, you know, they're, they're all there or thereabouts. And I just feel that if she came in now, is she really going to have that much of an impact? I don't know. So to answer your question, Ramon, um, I'd like to see her in there, but at the moment, I wouldn't want them to bring in someone who they're not going to be able to, to really give you know, a, a proper run with. Okay, and if so, I could add one last comment. I know we have forgot to mention Sue Young, too, who's, you know, getting a significant push. I, I think bringing them in, if they're going to bring her in, it like like just like we were we had uh, talked about last week with uh, Katarina. That, that's how you pronounce her name, right? Is it Katar- Katarina? Maybe if you bring her in, just for limited time, have her be a valet. Like I, I guess the thing is, if you're bringing her on board, what do you bring on a, on a board as? I mean, are you thrusting her in the knockouts division right away? Are you giving her a role where she's going to be some mouthpiece? I think if you're doing it like that, then that's fine. And then later on, you could obviously thrust her into the knockouts title picture once things kind of um, open up some. But I think just to have her on board and then throw her in the mix when you know we got you know Tessa and all all the people that you have mentioned, I think someone will end up getting lost in the shuffle. And you've also got Diamante as well, who might be coming back. We don't know. So, yeah, it, it seems like an overcrowded place at the moment. That's a good position to be in, but then someone always loses out. You know, we talked about Sienna already since losing the title. I know she's been injured, but she's kind of disappeared. Is she going to come back? You know, so th- there's lots of ifs and buts in this equation, because you, unless you have another belt, like a tag team title for the knockouts, which I know BQ has been talking about. I think you've mentioned it as well, uh, Ro, but unless you bring that back, there isn't much for these ladies to do because there's only one title and the roster, the knockout roster is nearly as big as, as the male roster, which, which is incredible. Uh, but it's being used well at the moment. And I just think that, you know, you, you add in someone else and you're really diluting everyone's impact. So thanks for the question. Keep them coming. If you've got one for next week, whether it's a Ramon or whoever else, just drop it in the comments and we'll do our very, very best to answer it on next week's show. Uh, so anyway, you, you all came here for the Impact Review. Uh, we're about, we're coming up, closing in on 10 minutes and we haven't even talked about this week's show. So why don't we just uh, dive straight in it and break it down? So, Ro, before we get into the details, what did you think of it overall as a show? I mean, comparing to last week's show, I thought this was a nice bounce back episode. Um, you know, the thing that I've been loving with Impact is there's, ma- you know, I'm watching some of these matches and it really has me invested. And also there's an entertainment aspect. Like every a- episode of Impact, I find myself just laughing, you know, at, you know, some of the silliest things or things maybe that aren't even meant to be funny. But just overall, I, I really felt like this episode you know, was a nice bounce back from next week. I mean, I'm sorry, last week. Um, 
Yes, uh, giving away spoilers there of the next week's being a good show <laughs> or a bad show, I should say. Um, for me, you see, I, I thought the opposite. I, I thought this unfortunately continued the trend of being a bad show. Now, obviously, at the Impact Lounge, we're all about positivity around the Impact show. And there were some good things in this, which we'll, which I'll get into. I know Ro has, has a differing opinion in that he thinks there's a lot of good things in this week's show. But I actually thought this week was was quite poor and very, very disappointing after last week's show. So... Why don't we just dive into it? The first thing I'd say is I thought the opening montage was brilliant. Really, really liked it. You know, where they, they started off with uh, Brian Cage showing his progress, you know, then the, the letters backstage of people getting beaten up. I, I just thought it was very, very good, the start. Uh, I, I, you know, I know we're not talking about the actual wrestling product here at the moment. We're just talking about, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the promo at the beginning. But I, I thought it was excellent. And they do this very, very well. Yeah, I think it's a nice feature to have. Like I said, it helps the viewer catch up on anything they might have missed. So I, I, I have no problem with it. And they also obviously built up, you know, under pressure in two weeks time, which is another good thing that they do, you know, really building up to make these TV pay-per-views, if that's the right word, or TV specials, feel like they are special and not just another run-of-the-mill program so yeah they're, they're doing a good job on the presentation in some aspects i think the biggest problem at the moment unfortunately is some of the wrestling and some of the booking decisions but i'm sure we'll talk about that as we go so case in point we had eli drake versus scott steiner versus z and e and there wasn't really any build to this and what i mean by that okay we had z and e last week and we've had a little bit of aggro between scott steiner and uh, Eli Drake, you know, with him not wanting back up for last week's show and commentary, you know, Josh did well selling that that kind of dissension well on commentary. But I don't know, this match just seemed like it was thrown together. Z and E have been together for one tag match before and then they're thrown into the title picture. You know, there wasn't any backstage promos with Steiner and Eli, which they could have thrown in there. I was just a bit disappointed that it's all happened so quickly. And also the glorious run combination of Steiner and uh, Eli Drake looks to be over already. Yeah, you know, I, as much as I like the match, I will say, and I'll get into some other stuff because I want to get your take on it as well. You know, it it seemed like, you know, even with Eli, and, you know, we were talking about this last week, you know, after watching this, it does make you wonder if maybe he's not resigning, you know, because you just look what's transpired this past month or so. You know, they give him the briefcase, he wins the tag titles, and in a span of two weeks, he loses both his uh, world title shot, it, world title shot match, I should say, and the tag titles. And, you know, before watching uh, Impact, I ended up watching Impact late this week. Um, one, of, one of the people I talked to on social media, Guy, shout out to Guy. You know, he had uh, tweeted out, you know, he was pissed at the finish of this match with Eli taking the pin and seeing it. I look at it from two fronts because obviously with DJ Z and Everett, uh, Everett got the pin on Eli, you know, it's deemed as a big deal because Eli is a big deal. You know, it's like I pinned the former world champion. You know how wrestlers like to play that. But then on the other end, too, you know, I don't I don't see why they didn't have Steiner take the pin because if you look in this match it's seen them putting the titles on uh djz and everett and i think that's probably in part because you know they they don't they probably realize well we can't have lax take the belts right back from them we need to have somebody else so it just everything just seemed rushed like there was no drawn out plan you know it just everything just seemed like it was just a last minute thing but hey i'm happy with djz and everett being tag team champions i hope you know, they get some mileage out of these guys because with them, along with LAX, OVE, and Coldly, there's your tag division there. You can build just from those four. But, I mean, we just got to see what was going to happen because if they're going to be doing making booking decisions like this, not taking the time to properly build some of these, whether it's the teams or angles or storylines, and everything's just going to be rushed, it's, it's not going to make much sense. It's not going to go over well on TV. Yeah, I, I mean... I I would have rather Colt of Lee have taken the belts off them, to be honest. I think they would have been a better choice because I just think Z and E have been thrown together too quickly and they shouldn't have had this match. I know they beat LAX last week, but you shouldn't be winning one match and then straight in the title picture, you know. And the other thing, as you say about eating the pin, 
they could have reversed those two roles where it was Eli Drake who hit Steiner. Because let's face it, it's Eli Drake who's been kind of casting the, you know, the dissension with between the two of them. He was the one last week who said, you know, I don't need you. And then it just seems that, you know, he should have been the one hitting Steiner in the head, you know, to take the pin as, as opposed to the other way around. But, you know, a, a strange booking. It seems to me, you know, it looks like Stein is gone, though. Well, I don't know. They're, they're obviously going to continue it, I would have thought, in some way. But you would imagine that Stein is not going to be around much more after this. Uh, and I just didn't like it. And once again, another problem is Steiner doesn't look like he's hurting people in the ring, which is weird for someone who, who's supposed to be Scott Steiner. His kicks look weak and those kind of things. And I just didn't enjoy this. I don't know what it is. I didn't enjoy it. Yeah, it. you know what? I guess the one thing way you could look at it too is like i said even with the dissension between the two that was rush you think of two weeks ago you know before he he like uh cashed in his uh world title match i mean everything was cool it just everything just seemed rush and i i get it it's probably has more to much more to do with steiner you know departing but there is a better way they could have went up, went with this i mean you could have just wrote him off tv and had eli have some replacement tag tag guy and i mean i i get it you know maybe that not what might have not went over as well but once again you have steiner eating the pin that's just as much of a big deal than having uh everett pin eli because you know steiner we know steiner's story career you know that's something hey i you know we i pinned steiner to win the tag team titles like yeah i, I don't know everything just seemed rush and i think we just got to see what's going to happen next with eli if they're going to thrust him back in the main event is he going to you know tread water or are we do we need to just enjoy eli right now because maybe he's not going to resign we just have to wait and see i guess what one thing i did like was the after celebration backstage with pt williams coming up and jumping on them and cheering for them i think that's a, a really good thing and you know i you know in real life if this was a proper you know bona fide sporting event you know, your friends would jump on you and celebrate so i quite like when they did it it made it feel more real and more special for them so you know fair play on that right um so yeah then we went to the studio with josh matthews and madison rain in there and one thing i noticed and, and we'll just dive straight into the match because obviously she joined in for commentary man she was annoying on commentary i didn't like her at all on commentary her voice just go it was honestly it was like fingernails down a, a blackboard it was terrible you know, I, I didn't pay too much attention to it like i've stated in the past a commentary with me i mean i'll catch certain things here and there but i I'm so invested in the matches at times, you know, and when they have their little segments in the studio talking, I mean, I hear some stuff, but yeah, I don't, I've never really paid too much attention. So, so what do you make of the match anyway? Cause I, I thought this was one of the better matches of the night. Oh, the Tessa versus Kiera Hogan, correct? Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't that long, but I, I quite enjoyed it for, for the length of time it did go. Um, I will say with Tessa, Tessa's money, she has that look, that TV look, you know, how sometimes you get some wrestlers who, come from the indies and they get on tv and they're not tv ready she's tv ready just everything where her mannerisms you know how you know she looks at the camera like everything's good no i, I thought this was decent a, a nice showing for tessa kiera hogan and i know on um, social media some people were talking about what well, was one person in particular talking about dang all she does is lose it's like you gotta look at it in kiera's case they're booking her as kind of like the young upstart like obviously i believe the company you know has big plans for her down the road but they want to properly build her because they have an opportunity to make her a homegrown talent you know we're always talking about you know them being able to develop talent with, from within versus always having to grab people who've you know been established elsewhere the thing i didn't like i, I didn't like the post-match angle because it looks like we're leading to a feud with between tessa and uh, madison rain I would have preferred somebody else to come out and aid Kara Hogan, um, who I don't know. It's I can't think of anyone at the top of my head right now. Um, I I I don't. I'm not really looking forward to a Madison Rain and Tessa feud because I, I I worry that the wrong person might go over, and obviously Tessa would be the one who needs needs to go over. But I worry that they might actually put Madison Rain over for some strange reason, maybe because of the ties to Josh. I don't know, but I would have preferred Tessa to be feuding with someone else. Absolutely right. And what what was laughable about this is that 
obviously Tessa's, you know, saying I'm better than anyone else. Yeah, I'm legit, all these kind of things. And then Madison Rain gets in the ring and Madison Rain is tiny. I mean, she's absolutely skeletal and she's physically threatened, apparently Tessa, by, by, by Madison Rain. I just don't get it. You know, it just seems strange booking, you know, and I, I would much rather that they would have booked this, that Madison would have got in to try and help Kira. Kiera, I can't say it, uh, and Tessa beat down Madison, leading to a feud that way. Yeah, I you know. agree. I agree. Totally. totally. It's just, I, I just didn't like it because once again, it's like you're seeing this person who barely came, you know, I don't want to say barely came back, but she joins the, you know, commentary team momentarily, and then she comes in, interfere, or I don't want to even say interfere, she goes for the save, and then the heel is the one that's backing out. I think had you had her just go in, you know, telling stop, and, uh, um, you know, she turns to aid Kiera and then Tessa just, you know, beats the hell out of her. I think it would have been better. It would ha it would have had me looking more forward towards the feud. But, yeah, that was, that was the only thing I didn't like. Yeah. Um, so then uh, we had Matthews recapping the backstage attacks. And, uh, yeah, I, I still don't know who this is. And it will be interesting to see. But uh, I'm actually quite interested and intrigued as to who it could be i mean i've got an idea and i read something online and i don't know if it was a spoiler or, or i don't think it is a spoiler because i don't think they've revealed it yet but you know someone mentioned who it could be and it kind of fits in but yeah i'm actually quite uh, curious as to see what goes on with this um next up we had grado with katarina going up against jimmy jacobs and congo kong I really like Jimmy Jacobs, I've got to say. Uh, you know, I, I think he, him and Congo Kong together, that is absolutely the best use for these guys. Although I don't really know. I know there's talk that Jimmy Jacobs isn't creative. I hope he is. Because if that's all they're using Jimmy Jacobs for, it seems a bit of a waste at the moment. Uh, but he is really good. You know, good speaker, good look. He's just right for Congo Kong. I'm beginning, and I didn't think I'd ever say this because he's a top guy, and I've said this before, but I'm beginning to get a bit tired of Grado now. Um, the, his overacting is beginning to annoy me, and that was one of the other things which I'll talk about later. Not so much to do with Grado, but sometimes it's good to have a comedy element in a match, but at other times it becomes over as to, I don't want to use the word Bush League, but it looks like it's some, it's like a dark match for the crowd to keep them entertained beforehand. It's not something that has any place having a comedy match like this, where Grado's doing, you know, funny skits and things like this in the ring and walking around stupidly. And then the next minute you've got something real like the Callahan and Eddie Edwards thing. The two of them next to each other, make a mockery of the product and and they completely take you out of it. And as I said, I don't mind if it's it's the opening match, something to get, you know, the crowd going, even if it's something that's not aired on TV or there's explosion. But uh, honestly, it, it seems so out of place having Grado go up against uh, Congo Kong. I, I don't know if you had uh, thoughts on it. I think what it does is it really hurts Congo Kong in some ends because with Congo Kong, they've, booked him as this monster and the one thing i like about uh the match is when they uh reference how congo kong uh, took out johnny impact and we haven't seen him since so then that let me know that you know once johnny impact comes back they're going to continue their feud which i think is great for the both of them especially congo kong but it, it takes away from congo kong because he's this serious monster like character and you got him facing some comedy guy if you're gonna fa have him facing grado it should be like a minute match. You know, Grado yeah. tries to do something. Kong Kong hits one move, splash over. I think doing all that other other stuff, it, it just, you don't want to drag hit, drag Kong Kong down to, you know, to that level because you've built him up as this, this monster. I was really hoping, <laughs> I was really hoping when they had, a, um, when they had put, uh, propped up the, uh, the stairs on the ring, I thought he was in a dark Grado like how he did Johnny Impact. And I, you know, thought that would have been cool. But then, obviously, we get the moose save. But, yeah, I, I, I'm I, in agreement with you. I think with Grado, I get the comedy aspect. But there's only so many wrestlers you can pit him against. And that stuff can work well. I really don't want to see it when, and I know Kong Kong's not there yet. But I guess main eventers, I don't want to see that. You know, I, if, if he's going to face a main eventer or somebody who they got big plans for, they need to just run right through him. 
Grado has got he's an impact wrestler, isn't he? Whereas you know he's like the step up from Richard Justice, isn't it? You got Richard Justice, who's always going to get squashed. Grado might win the odd match on 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 explosion, but you're right. He has to keep that comedy shtick in line a little bit, and and I just didn't enjoy it. Obviously, as we said, Moose came down to the save, so it's good that they're continuing that thing. Do you know? I'm so over Moose. I I, I I'm bored of him now. I I. I <laughs> That's awful to say because he's never even main evented. But I, I know you've talked about you think he might be world champion come slam anniversary. I, 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 I kind of I have lost all interest in Moose. There's so many more interesting people on the roster. Well, with that, I'm obviously wrong about that now. Um, it looks like he's lost in the shuffle, like we were talking about earlier. Once again, and I hate to beat a dead horse, but why did they take the briefcase off of him again? It's something with having that briefcase, I think, when, when you have something like that where somebody has a future title shot, that gives them the opportunity that any time they can challenge for it. So that's something that they can, you know, consistently bring up. But he he just seems lost right now. There's really no, no place for him right now. And what I mean there's no place is, now he fused with Kong, then what's next? You know, I... I you know, and I was fantasy booking on online. I said, you know, if they really did did things right, and not that I'm being critical, but you could have built Moose up where you give him the big title in that slam anniversary against Eli Drake, and then at Bound for Glory, you could build a Moose versus Brian Cage. I think that's that's a money matchup right there. But you know, they you know, with some of the booking, as much as praise as I've given the company and these episodes of Impact, you know, some of the booking decisions, it seems like they make a mistake or they're rushing it. They're not really taking their time to see how it's going to translate on TV. And in the results, you know, we get situations like this. Just very quickly, they also seem to be building up the, the Katarina Grado storyline that she's not interested in him, which I don't really see where this goes, to be honest. But uh, it does seem like that's another little subtle storyline that's going on that, you know, he's totally besotted and she doesn't really seem that interested in him. But um, anyway, um, next up, we had possibly the weirdest promo of the night. Well, it was actually before the match. It was Pentagon Jr. and Phantasma cutting a quick promo. I have no idea where the reference to chocolate kept on coming on. I don't know if you if you listened to this and scratched your head, but they kept on saying that he was chocolate or something. I I, I don't know, but it was weird. That's a phantasma. I think that's one of his uh, nicknames, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> right. Okay. I, I, but anyway, they, they are being booked as faces. Um, and maybe not so obvious with Pentagon Jr., because obviously he doesn't talk that much. He doesn't really come over as a, a face or a heel. He comes over as nothing, really. Uh, but the way that they're trying to make Austin Aries a bit of an arrogant, you know, asshole backstage makes me think that they're trying to make Pentagon a face by not being Austin Aries. And Matt Seidel's obviously a heel. So they've suddenly switched Phantasma around from being a heel since his whole run in Impact to now suddenly being a face, including changing his mask to a white mask. Uh, I don't know if you noticed that. He's now wearing white ring gear. And maybe it's... Go ahead, finish. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, you know, let's go back to the Cowboys and Indians. You know, the, the bad guys wear black, the good guys wear white. And and they've just suddenly, since he's won the, the number one contendership, that's him. He's now a face, apparently. So it was it was unusual. They waver, they've wavered back and forth with him. He's really not had any kind of a stable uh, uh, allegiance. Like he's either been face or heel. Um, they've wavered back and forth with him. I will say this: Is it me or does it impact seem a, a really uh, heel heavy? Like I really can't point out who's all faces. I mean, in the knockouts division, it's more clear. But you know, when you think of all the other divisions, I mean. I can tell you more so who's healed than versus who's face outside of who Eddie Edwards. And I mean, we don't even know if he's faced with some of the actions he's done. Like they seem to be really hill heavy. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose you got Moose and Johnny impact. I suppose they're the two main faces um, after, as you say, Eddie Edwards, but he's gone heel. So after that, Grado, <laughs> Falabar, I don't know. You're quite right. Uh, you know, there's a lot of characters who, who sit in that, tweener role you know like austin aries the crowd love him even though he's trying to be a heel and the same with eli drake the crowd love him even though he's supposed to be a heel but um yeah it, it, it is strange isn't it that there doesn't seem to be a real baby face in the company and you know although i say i'm so over moose you know he could be that guy uh, other than that you're right 
so there you go. There's a question. There's our first question for the listeners, other than our trivia question earlier on. Who would you think should be the top baby face for Impact, who they can build their their uh, product around? Right. Okay. So we then did have the the Kong uh, Grader match, which we we jumped ahead to earlier. So after that, we had LAX. Well, just doing a backstage skit with Trevor Lee and Caleb Conley, a cult of Lee. I, I love this. This this was bizarrely, I think, one of the best parts of the show, even though it was only 30 seconds long. Uh, you know, these two stables, they've got they're booking them exactly right. You know, they don't have to be on TV, but just giving them a backstage segment 30 seconds long in a two hour show. You know what these characters are about. You're keeping them interesting. You're keeping them fresh. Yeah, I like the interaction. Um, it lets us know that Colt Lee's still a tag team too. So you know, maybe they're gonna have a feud. Or I mean, I know this is this isn't their first go around, but this is great. I think what's gonna what it'll help a lot of these divisions is you know you having side feuds that aren't revolved around the title at times. So you can, you can have them go at it while LAX is still trying to get their stuff together, and uh, Colt Lee's trying to get back in title cont- contention. So yeah, great. Excellent. Next up, we had the House of Hardcore match. So first of two matches outside the arena. Um, I didn't like it. Uh, And my main reason was just the production on it, you know, that it was quite hard to see what was going on at times because of the camera work, because they didn't have a fixed camera like they do in the impact ring. Now, aside from that, though, I didn't actually like the match that much. Now, I'm not bloodthirsty or anything like that, but this, you know, if they're saying you can't do this in an impact ring, well, to be honest, that was no different to some of the matches we've seen in an impact ring. Um, you know, I was expecting it to be a bit more brutal, those kind of things. And and the ending, you know, there were some good spots in it. Like, I like the bit through the chairs, which usually break, but didn't in this instance, you know, when uh, he did a suplex into them. Uh, you know, but it ended quite easily. And I know it wasn't really about the match. It was more to do with the aftermatch bit. But I, I don't know. I, I just... You know, the feud's going to continue, which is good, because I think there's still some mileage in it. And when they do have their payoff, it shouldn't be at a House of Hardcore show or Destiny Wrestling or wherever. It should be in an impact ring. You know, the thing I thought was, and I'm learning too, when I'm watching Impact, the one thing that takes me out, when they have one match that's away from Impact, I'm fine. But when they have two, let alone back-to-back, um, that's what I think thing has been taking me out of it at times. But uh, with that said, yeah, this this match, man, um, for given the you know the participants and the feud that they have going on, this seemed like just a regular match that you'd see in Impact. I mean, it didn't seem like you know so much of a street fight outside of you know the of uh, doing them doing moves on chairs and and whatnot. It just seemed like a regular match. I didn't really get feel like. Like, oh, this feud's going to continue, even though I know it is, obviously. But, yeah, it just seemed like a regular match. I thought the ending was presented well, where he goes nuts. But we're always expecting that anyway, weren't we? Um, And I don't know where this leads. I don't know if it's leading to an Eddie versus Tommy Dreamer feud or whether there is going to be, you know, a carry on with Callahan. I I, I don't know. That that part of it is interesting. Although I don't know if I really want to see an Eddie versus Tommy Dreamer feud. But it does look like it's going to go that way to some extent. Yeah, I mean, we'll we'll see. Like I said, it's just I think one of one of the things sometimes when we're getting you know these uh, feuds with uh, individuals and they have a series of matches. Obviously, you're always going to have one that's kind of weak, weaker than the rest. And I would say out of all of them, this was probably the weakest out of the matches that they've had thus far. Mm-hmm. So up next, we had uh, another out of ring. Um wrestling segment from destiny wrestling this time and we carried on with uh, brian cage's world tour and i don't have a problem with this I'm, i've been really enjoying these matches against guys we haven't seen and as we said last week it's good to see brian cage you know not struggling against these guys but at least having competitive matches and not just squashing everyone this one though i think was the weakest of the three we've had so far and i don't think it was even facade's fault i think that they did too many cuts during the show. You know, it was like, oh, now we rejoin it later on in the match and things like that. And it just didn't seem to flow to me. 
yeah, I didn't. This was the thing I didn't like, um, which is a shame because I think the way that they've been showcasing Brian Cage, because apparently they weren't able to get him at the tapings, showing these matches that he's appeared on in other promotions, it helps. Like I said previously, I hate the positioning of these matches where they have, you know, they give us two back to back out of impact matches. I like it more when they're spaced out. I think what hurt this match, like you were saying, is the edit, the cutting, the cutting, because the way that it was presented, it seemed like it was a squash. And I mean, I got sense enough to know, you know, you watching it, it probably wasn't a squash. Like the way it was portrayed, uh, the guy's name's Facade, it looked like he didn't get anything in. Like he was just being thrown around and it seemed like it was a long, a long match. I really would have liked to see what Fasad was able to do to Cage. I mean, even if it was minimal offense, but it just looks like it was a squash that was edited to be presented as a squash. Which which is a shame because the other ones haven't been. Um, and it could have been a very good match for all we knew. It's just that we didn't get to see it. So um, in the British taping now, we, we also had a, a bonus match, which I don't think you guys got, but it was another random one. Uh, it was Austin Aries versus uh, the Brian Kendrick for the, I believe it was the X Division title uh, from one of the pay-per-views. So I, I, I'm guessing you guys didn't get this, did you? But we had the full match, <laughs> which was just thrown in there randomly. And the weird thing about it was they went to break, and when they came back, this match was showing. It wasn't even like it was introduced. It was suddenly, actually, as the have I gone on to the next show? Did I fall asleep here or something? And they're showing a rerun. It was, it was bizarre. But anyway, that was in there. Uh, and then when we finally got back to, to the proper impact that you guys got, it's not going to surprise any, well, it's not going to surprise anyone, but the next bit, KM versus and Falabar backstage. I love this. Uh, this is, ex I talked about comedy earlier on and, and not liking comedy matches, but I'm absolutely fine with this. And I think it, it's great how they're giving both Fala and they're giving KM something to do, keeping their characters at a, at a high point, keeping them in the, the minds of the viewers uh, and not actually making a mockery of of wrestling as, as a sport, you know, because it doesn't matter if you're funny backstage in the real world. If you then try and carry that into the ring, you're going to get beaten up, which is what doesn't happen with Grado. But with these guys being funny backstage, I think is absolutely fine. And this was, I think, a really nice uh, segment. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm I'm really looking forward to see what happens. I mean, are these guys going to end up teaming up or, you know, try their hand at teaming up again? Or are we going to get a feud? Um but yeah, this is the kind of comedy that you can have where, you know, it's you're not dragging anybody down. You know, it's harmless fun. I love the bit where KM said, can you turn sideways? Where'd you go? Where'd you go? <laughs> I, thought, <laughs> I thought I was excellent. I was laughing way too much, that, that, that more than I should have been anyway. So, yeah, it, it's obviously at some point they're either going to be a bona fide, you know, uh, tag team. And I hope they are or they're going to have a feud, which seems strange to have them feuding. Have Tyrus come in and upset the kind of storyline, put them together and then have them feuding again. It doesn't make sense to me. I hope that they do carry on. Um, but there you go. Right. Uh, I don't know if you're going to agree with me on this, but the next segment, the funeral of Rosemary, I think was the best thing on the show all night. I thought I thought it was excellent. And I talk about high school editing of these kind of segments in the past. The thing I loved about this was the music, you know, that kind of female solo vocal over the top of it i just thought it was presented very very well the only thing i didn't like about it and it's a very very minor thing is is that they cut away from the ending too quickly it just seemed like you know they could have had just a shot of them all standing watching the coffin burn you know for a good 20 30 seconds with some evil cackling or something but it just seemed to as soon as it was burning they cut away very quickly and that 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 kind of spoiled the cinema but i thought overall Really good presentation, really great way to write Rosemary off telly for a little bit and to carry on, you know, the weirdness of what's going on with Sue Young. Yeah, I thought the presentation was excellent. I just wonder, and I'm sure a lot of fans now, the follow up with this once Rosemary's healthy and returns is really going to be interesting. You can't have her come back and just kind of just place her anywhere else. Obviously, there's a feud waiting between her and Sue Young, but I really am interested to see what's the follow up because, you know, they set the casket on fire. Okay, so we're we're led to believe that Rosemary's no more. So what's gonna happen next? So they have a good opportunity, and you know they got plenty of time to plan ahead. Because um, for those of you who don't know, I know I think Rosemary had a uh, torn her ACL, 
So I usually with an injury like that, I think that's like six to eight months. So she's going to be on the shelf for quite a bit. So this is giving Sue Young an opportunity to really grow her character. And then once Rosemary returns, the follow up. So I'm really interested to see the what's going to happen once Rosemary returns. But yeah, this was excellent. The presentation was incredible. Yeah, really, really good. And uh, funny enough, Rosemary's got a load of people that she can come back and feud with. She can feud with Ali for interfering. She, she hasn't really had the Red Wedding with Tyre, so there's always you know the possibility that you could continue with that as well. So there's loads of stuff for Rosemary to come back to. And uh, you know, as you say, if she's out for six to eight months, even with their partnerships, you know, you could have Rosemary pop up at you know at different promotions which are unadvertised those kind of things you know for for impact you know sh showing that she's close to coming back and you know i i just think that there's so many possibilities and and we've always said that the knockout division is booked very very well although we criticized madison rain earlier on uh but generally the knockouts has been booked excellently and uh that this was uh by far the best segment of the night for me, other than KM and Falabar, of course, you know, but you know, they're always going to be my favorite thing. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. So then we went on to the main event. And before I give you my thoughts on this, um, what, without looking at the actual wrestling in the match, we'll come on to it in a second, but what did you think about the way this was booked? Well, the one thing I pointed out, what I thought was silly and not to look too much into it, <laughs> you think about uh, Austin Aries and Matt Seidel were feuding not too not too long ago, so now they're all you know uh, they're tag team partners now. And once again, you know we got Austin Aries coming out wearing that Grand Championship all proud. And you know I, I, on the teleconference, I know um, Don had uh, spoke about it. He didn't really give. Um, really uh, any much clarity as far as is a belt going to be scrapped but it seemed like the the less belts the better you know he's not one to have a whole bunch of championships so you know it's to be determined but no I, I, I had no problem with it because I think when you get these type of matches where you know two contenders are in this case you got uh, one heel contender, who, the contender who's challenging for the world title and the contender challenging for the X Division Championship, you know, are competing against one another with, you know, in a tag team, obviously. Um, I like these kind of matches because it, it helps build towards the eventual title matches, if that, if that makes much sense. No, absolutely. I, and I think it's a good way to keep feuds fresh, isn't it? That you involve other people, so you're not seeing the same kind of thing week in, week out. So, yeah, I have no problem with the match. My biggest issue is just the fact that they can't decide on who's face and who's heel. And, you know, it, it just seems such a mess at the moment. And that's one thing that the, that the current team have not done in a long time, and that's blur these lines of who do we cheer for? I mean, who were the crowd supposed to be cheering for in this match? I, I couldn't tell you. If you put it down on paper, I couldn't tell you who they're supposed to be cheering for. And if you get that in a main event, then you've done something wrong. Now, it should be that they should be cheering on for Pentagon and whoever's facing Seidel. But Phantasma, as we said earlier on, has been booked as a heel for the, for the longest time. And I know he's flip-flopped between the two, but suddenly he's a face. That, that would have made no sense to the actual crowd in the place because obviously his face turn has been done in a segment earlier on in the night. So they were being cheered as well. The, the luchadors were being cheered in this, even though Pentagon Jr., has, you know, I know he's got a history on Lucha Underground and, and on the Indies and these kind of things. As, as You know, and everyone was chuffed the bits when, when, when he got the title. But let's face it, I don't think he's been a, a great title holder for, for Impact. I don't think he's really added anything. He's not done promo work. He hasn't turned up in other places holding the title, defending it, those kind of things. I, I think it's been, it's been a lackluster, absolutely lackluster uh, title reign. And the one thing I think as well is if the original main event at, when was it? Um, was it the event in New Orleans? Was that when um, Alberto was supposed to be there? I can't remember. Which one he, yeah, I think it was at New Orleans. I think Alberto was most probably going to win that title. Well, you know, if, if I had to say the one criticism that I could have, like I thought the main event was excellent, by far my favorite match. And I love the ending sequence where you had a uh, Seidel going for the shooting star only to get hit with a super kick. I, I think Seidel's the best at being able to um, 
take moves like that where he can perform his move while taking another one. But I will say, I think, and we talked about this earlier, the one criticism of the booking is is they seem to rush things. I think they don't let things play out. Even if you do it two weeks, like Austin Aries drops the Impact World Championship, the next episode of Impact, he's heel. You know, there's nothing that led up to his heel turn. Not even no in-ring kind of segment where, you know, maybe he's congratulating Phantasma only to attack him and beat him down. That way, that lets the audience know, like, oh, okay, he's, you know, all, all they had him do was come out, address the Impact roster, talking about, you know, this belt that he's carrying is the real world champion, you know, being cocky. I mean, that, I think in this day and age, that doesn't necessarily generate heel heat like it used to maybe you know once upon a time and then in um pentagon's case you know they kind of just put the belt on him and i get i get for the shock value but they really haven't done too much to follow it up like if i'm a casual viewer i'm looking at it like oh they put the belt on this guy who you know who is this guy oh he's with lucha underground oh here we go typical well uh uh, impact booking you know put it on an outsider they haven't done enough to make him seem like he's an impact guy even though we know you know he's part of lucha and it, like you said even with the promo the promo work i mean i i thought that backstage segment that they had earlier i thought that was nice but that's something that they should have been doing with him the moment that they put the belt on him but yeah his, this rain i mean i've enjoyed him i i really think he's the real deal but they haven't done enough to build him up as a a guy it looks more at least to me as just a guy that they put the belt on yeah absolutely and and going back to the actual match now as well because I, i've seen phantasma as king cuerno in as i said watch series season one of lucha underground and, and king cuerno was fantastic the phantasma doesn't look half the wrestler that king cuerno is which is weird because obviously it's the same guy but i i don't know he talking about the wrestling Phantasma looked bored in this match. I mean, if you go back and watch it, there's a few bits. And I noticed it last week in the number one contender as well. And I know he's had some issues with, with the backstage, the fact that he was left off the New Orleans po poster and those kind of things. Uh, Redemption poster, sorry. He was left off it, you know, and, and he made comments about it. Um, but he doesn't look like he wants to be there in his wrestling ability. And it's a shame because the kid can go. But there was a few times he it looked like he was stood there waiting for moves to happen to him. And it just... You know, when you see teams like LAX who are just so fluent, you know, doing these things, uh, it, it stood out a mile. So you had him, first of all. Then you had Austin Aries, who I haven't seen overselling like that since I do remember the HBK match versus Hogan. I do remember this. <laughs> yeah. It, it was almost to the, that extent. I mean, it was ridiculous. He was, you know, walking around the wing, ring, falling on his knees every step, you know, as if he was knocked out on his feet. And it was it was getting into Grado comedy at points. It was honestly unbelievably bad. And I was thinking, what is Aries doing? You know, th this is a guy who, you know, people have said has had a bad attitude. And then he goes out and does this in the ring. I would be furious if I was watching this back and I was management, you know, thinking that this is the guy who's been, you know, held two of our belts in the last, you know, since coming back two months ago. I'd be furious with him, the way that he acted in this match. And you got Pentagon Jr., who is world champion and should be putting on a, a, a masterclass clinic because he can't promo, let's face it. And he was all right. But Seidel was, was the MVP of this match by far. He, he was the only one there who looked like he really cared and was really trying. So I was hugely disappointed with this, bearing in mind you have four guys who have obviously got huge wrestling ability. And this is the best that they could come up with. I was, it, it was, for me, it soured the show. It, it really did sour. And, and I know we're supposed to be positive, but, you know, other than Seidel, no one came out of this looking good. I think in Phantasma's case, maybe it's frustration. And if it is, that's fair because, you know, the one thing I look at with him, you think of, you know, they put the uh, the Impact World Championship on Pentagon. Then, you know, a couple months ago, they had Ishimori, uh, X Division champion. What, like, what they're doing with Phantasma, they're not using him to his best abilities. Like, they've yet to pull the trigger on him. And then the one thing that he has going for him, he could speak English. He can cut, cut a promo. And I know that's sometimes what's the fear with some of these partnerships is you can't really give some of these guys a mic because maybe the, you know, the English isn't really good or, you know, the language barrier, whatever the case may be. And you're not going to pair everyone with a manager. So 
the fact that they haven't really capitalized on him, it's kind of unfortunate because I really think if you put a belt on him, I, I, I really think, you know, the promos, one of the best promos that I seen him cut, and it was when they had the whole Triple A thing going on. He was in the ring, and, and he was heel at the time. And I, I forgot... I can't think of word for word, but pretty much he was trying to get a triple A chant going and, you know, everyone was booing it, but I thought it was some excellent stuff because he's able to talk, able to speak perfect English, like why they haven't done more with a guy. I don't get it. And as far as with Austin Aries, um, like I said, maybe it's frustration on his end too, which I don't think he has any right to be frustrated because, you know, the moment he came on, they put a rocket on his back and just you know so i mean he should he should be cool but you know maybe he's mad that he lost on two occasions he lost at the the impact versus lucha and then he loses his belt at um redemption so yeah i don't know but sidell you know credit to sidell his heel character he's been owning it you know it was a slow burn but you know eventually it's really it's taken off now and great work on his end yeah, absolutely. I uh, can't disagree with anything you said there. And I can understand why Phantasma, uh, you know, m- might feel that way. But at the same time, you know, he's a pro. He should be going out there and still delivering, you know, a, a good match. And the, what I was most upset by was Austin Aries, because I've always been a huge supporter of this guy. Uh, but I just honestly that the overselling really spoiled it for me. But there you go. Anyway, uh, any other thoughts on this week's show, Rob? Because obviously I've been quite damning this week. You've you've been the, the shining light, you know, keeping me together, keeping me away from that Samaritans hotline. So, uh, yeah, anything else to add about the show? I mean, like I said, I thought it was a nice bounce back. I mean, obviously there's criticisms. I mean, <laughs> you know, I didn't think I'd have as many, you know, uh, now that talking to you now. But I think, once again, we kind of see sometimes the trend – and for the most part with this regime, they've been well. But when you have the block of tapings towards the end, because I know in June, the first week of June, we're getting a new set of tapings. So we've kind of seen this this trend where the last uh, couple episodes on, you know, the block of tapings are usually not as great as maybe the first initial ones. So I think with these new set of tapings and then we got under pressure coming up um, where we're going to get you know, idea of what's going on with whom. So if there's certain people that we're worried about, I know in this case, Eli Drake will have a better understanding what his future holds. Um, But let me just do a quick rundown real quick. So for next... Actually, before you do that, Rob, before you do that, Rob, one thing I just thought about that was missing about this uh, show was uh, there was no alley on it. You know, we had the the funeral of uh, Rosemary. And last week we had that segment about, you know, uh, Ali looking in the mirror and then, you know, shaking her head and twitching and having the bunny outside and then this week there was no follow-up on that uh, it just occurred to me there which um yeah it, it seems strange that she wasn't even referenced in the uh in, in the, the funeral as well yeah you know what that's one thing i'd like to see them do a better job of you know they know who their stars are especially your champions you know she's knockouts champion what they need to do is when they're not scheduled to be on that episode have some sort of reference i think that goes a long way and like i was saying with the congo kong grado match when they talked about how they uh, uh congo kong threw johnny impact into the stairs i thought that was important because it lets you know that yeah johnny impact's still around but he's selling the injuries that he took at the hands of congo kong so they got to do a better job better job with that but yeah, you know, I, I come to think of it, I didn't even realize that that she wasn't on the card. That's crazy. Yeah. Anyway, uh, sorry, Ro, you go for the rundown. Yeah, okay, just real quick. So for next week, we're going to get Congo Kong versus Moose, OVE versus Drago and Aerostar, LAX versus Cult of Lee, and I'm guessing, I don't know, but we got Matt Seidel defending the X Division Championship against phantasma in the main event um i'm really hoping phantasma pulls it off here um that's just my my thing i mean but obviously we'll see where it goes but and then off, obviously in a couple of weeks we're getting under pressure which i'm excited for i like that impacts giving us these pay-per-view like shows that buys us time leading up to the next pay-per-view because obviously july 22nd we're getting slam anniversary so uh some excellent stuff on our hands yeah, I've got to say, I'm looking forward to the title matches, and I do think they need to freshen up the all, all the belts. You know, I, I've not been convinced by 
Pentagon Junior holding it. Uh, having said that, the problem you've got is that one of the other belts, the Grand Championship, is still on Arsenari. So does he hold two? Does he hold one? I don't know. Um, but I'd like to see that go on to someone else who deserves it. You know, a KM, a Congo Kong, someone like that, Brian Cage. X Division, I'm quite happy Seidel holding that for a bit longer. I think uh, he's being used right in that one. Uh, the tag teams, I don't like Z and E, but they've only just taken it, so hopefully they'll hold on to it for a little while. So I think they, they could do with a bit of a freshen up, uh, but certainly at the top end, I, I think something needs to change because Aries versus Pentagon for me isn't working and you need a bigger character. Austin Aries is a big character, but he hasn't got the belt pentagon has at the moment and i just think we you need to do something in that main event because at the moment it doesn't seem like there's a real star power in that main event and we've talked about that before you know with some of the you know like when it was eli versus johnny impact we were saying that it didn't feel like that that was the real story it felt like it was more a few between impact and, and alberto and at the moment I don't think it's even that strong in the main event, and that, and that's a problem for Impact. But I, I think they will they, they'll get there, and they've got some interesting things. They've got some really strong mid card characters waiting to take that step up next. But I do think that they could add one or two more people from the independents who could slot into a main event scene. And you know, for example, I, I would love it if someone like people are going to shoot me down here and feel free to do so on the comments people but i would love it if someone like ryback came in or jack swagger or or someone like that i know they're ex-wwe guys and we always talk about these kind of things but i think they need a big character like that because even though you've got someone like brian cage he's not the most charismatic person and i think you need someone who is going to be charismatic in that main event eli is the guy obviously but we don't know if he's going to be about so uh, before we go, Ro, any thoughts on what I just said? Would you like to see Ro back or Swagger? No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what? I mean, maybe down the road. I think the problem is, and you can dissect each division, and I'll try to do this relatively quick. With the tag division now, I think at least f for the moment, you got the champions, Z and Everett. You got LAX, you got OVE and the Cult of Lee. Build off of that, okay? You can just have those four teams feuding for the belt, belt for the next six months. Fine, that's good, okay? With the X Division, um, you know, they've really been good with the X Division. I mean, you can really plug any anybody in there, so that's fine. Same thing with the knockouts. Um, I think you got tons of women to be able to challenge and, you know, but I think it's the mid card in the world. The problem is, that i don't like with i'll get into the world first is you know we're talking you know you're talking about it being weak they're not putting enough faith in the roster that they have and elevating certain individuals because why not why couldn't you have i mean obviously after their feud ends but why not put eddie edwards or, although i'd prefer in the mid card eddie edwards and callahan you could put them in the main event moose I mean, obviously, you got Eli. There's tons of people. I think resorting to trying to get people from off the street, so to speak, to thrust them in. I mean, what are you telling your roster? You know, you're putting them ahead of the line when you got these people trying to, you know, climb, uh, move on up. So I would really like to see them work from within. I think Austin Aries is a great enough talent where you can put him in, you know, a few with Moose or some of these other guys where – It'll be fine. And then obviously with Brian Cage, you slowly build him up to get him to that point. Not everyone's going to be charismatic or, you know, be a mat technician. You're going to get a nice blend of things. And then with the mid card, and I know I bring the grand title up so much, I guess because I feel like there's potential there that they're not uh, fulfilling. But it just annoys me to see Austin Aries, a guy of his caliber, come out with the belt and not do anything with it. Like if if you if he if someone else would have been champion and they weren't mentioning it, like I'm just gonna throw a name out there. Like say if it was Grado, okay, out of all people, and they weren't mentioning it, then I would think more in lines of like, all right, they're done with it. But to have Austin Aries, why not have him defend the belt? You know, give somebody an opportunity. You could really help elevate somebody. Like they, what they just have to do, they have to um, put have faith in the roster that they have. They can't always resort into grabbing people from the street. And then trying to thrust them into, you know, title pictures. If you're going to bring people in, slowly build them up. Like, I think what makes Brian Cage excellent is it's a slow build with him. You know, they're slowly building him up. Where if he gets a title, 
shot at Bound for Glory, you, we can look back on all these months, the buildup for him. So it wasn't like they just brought him in and then boom. So I, I, I'm just more of the mindset that I would like to see them work with what they got. And then once they feel like that's not clicking, then go ahead and if you need to grab, you know, a Jack Swagger, a Ryback, or, you know, free agent, Rene, um, who I, who I haven't named and you know you listeners can you know you I know you guys a lot of times share people you guys would like to see an impact then go that route but use what you have because like you stated there's only a two-hour show you can't get everybody on tv you can't push everybody so when you're bringing in other people who they're going to be thrusted right away someone else is getting lost they get disgruntled they leave and then you know there you go I think that's a, a good place to, to finish it the the only one who I, I might throw in there that, that they maybe should have kept around and would have been ideal for times like this would have been a James Storm, you know, someone like that. But anyway, he's no longer with us. That makes it sound like he's dead. I assure you, he's a, Mrs. Storm, if you're listening, he's fine. Um, yeah, so uh, apart from that, yeah, next week is bound to be a better show, in my opinion, because uh, I think this was just a, a bit of a train wreck for me. And uh, yeah, so hopefully next week will be better. If you enjoyed this week's show, make sure that you leave us some comments below. Just to remind you of that trivia question again that Rose set us earlier on. Three clues as to who, well, who is Rose talking about? Uh, have you got them there, Rose? Do you want to read them out or do you want me to go for it? Yeah, I'll, I'll, let me do it one more time. So it's name that wrestler. And the three clues I'm going to give you guys is the first one. He's been an impact on more than one occasion with the first time being under a different gimmick. The second one is he shares two things in common with Ishimori. And then lastly, he appeared in a music video with the real McCoy. Who am I? There you go. And uh, the other question that we posed during the show was, uh, who do you think should be Impact's top babyface? Who's currently on the roster, obviously. Right. Uh, that's us for this week. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure you hit the subscribe. We want to get to 4,000. Share it with your friends. Let anyone out there who's a fan of Impact listen to this show and uh, they'll be hooked from then on in. Well, that's my theory anyway. Right. Have a good week, people. We'll catch you next week. Bye.